Good afternoon and welcome to the Washington Outsider. Uh, we are back to discuss the two years, the events that have passed since uh, uh, in the two years since Qasem Soleimani was liquidated in an airstrike. With us today to discuss uh, this important topic is Antipat Kanbar, who is the president of the Future Foundation who, and who has a background as a deputy military attaché and an Iraqi spokesperson. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been an eventful couple of years, but the last few weeks leading up to uh, the anniversary of Soleimani's uh, death have been fraught with, uh, with an uptick in activity from Iran on many fronts. We have seen uh, a spike in cyber attacks on Israel, uh, which is being blamed for Soleimani's uh, liquidation. We have seen threats to Trump officials. We have seen a number of former Trump officials um, being sanctioned by Iran uh, in connection to something that happened uh, two years ago. They were not sanctioned in immediately. Uh, and we have also seen attacks on US sites by Iran-backed militias in Iraq. Uh, the Pentagon attributed these attacks to them. Uh, but there has been no significant response from the United States to any of this. What is the significance of these events taking place two years after the alleged offense uh, that the U.S. has uh, done to Iran by liquidating Soleimani? And what has been the impact of Soleimani's departure on Iran's successes in the region? Well, uh, thank you for uh, inviting me. Well, uh, it's important to understand uh, why Soleimani is important and uniquely important. And, uh, and I'm going to go through, uh, 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 I would call the evidence, which I have seen firsthand when I participated in the Iraqi government. I was a spokesperson for the late Ahmed Chalabi, Dr. Chalabi, and uh, uh, he was deputy prime minister. I was his deputy in the governing council. And I attended many high level meetings, some of it with the Iranians and some of it within the Shia bloc, which I, Chalabi was a member of. In fact, I was a spokesman even of the Shia bloc for a while. And uh, I think it's important to review and correct history. Qasem Soleimani has been always very significant in Iran. Let me uh, start early on, before 2003, there was a deal between the United States of America and Iran brokered, and Chalabi was at the center of it, uh, to basically uh, uh, get guarantees from Iran. They will not attack or kill Americans when the United States of America is liberating Iraq and invading Iraq. And this deal was brokered in a shuttle diplomacy or shuttle travel be between Tehran and Washington. We even opened office for the Iraqi National Congress in Tehran with American funding. We got exception from OFAC. I thought, we thought that was a very good deal to uh, uh, you know, uh, prevent bloodshed and uh, make the invasion of Iraq or the liberation of Iraq uh, goes smoothly without, with the minimum amount of American casualties and, and the Iraqi casualties. Now, uh, throughout history or my encounters, I learned that uh, some from people who worked close with Soleimani in Tehran, they told me that uh, Soleimani was one of the uh, major figures in Iran who opposed the, the deal, who opposed the American uh, invasion with sort of uh, neutrality from Tehran. Uh, and uh, this, is this is evident by a very famous speech by Hassan Nasrallah before 2003, in which he warned from the American invasion and the removal of Saddam, in, in which the he extended his, his hand to Saddam. Saddam, who fought Iran eight years after 1991, and many, many people, even smart people in Washington, missed that. After 1991 war with the United States of America and his 
expelling from Kuwait, established a very strong relation with Iran. He handed all the Iraqi Air Force uh, 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 jets to Iran, and he opened channels. And the Iranian Atala'at, their intelligence, had a very strong presence in southern Iraq and even in Baghdad. So Qasim Soleimani was thinking was, we have established good relations with Iran. Iraq is smuggling the oil uh, be, because of the sanctions through Iran. By the way, the same smuggling routes are used by Iran now. And uh, there's no reason to remove Saddam. He's weak, he's incapable, and he is, and Iran has a good grip on Iraq. Anyway, when the war happened, despite his opposition, uh, 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 the, the idea uh, still didn't go off his mind. Soleimani, uh, opposite of the United States of America, is very consistent and very resilient. And one, one other reason he opposed the war, uh, the Iranians thought that a removal of Saddam by the United States of America will be historical, historically damaging to Iran and shameful to Iran because they lost a million people fighting Iraq for eight years and they couldn't rule Saddam. And then Saddam will be removed by, by uh, the United States of America and friends of the United States of America, which is us, which we are not in the pocket of Iran or we are not mullahs. So uh, that's, uh, that goes back to the ISIS war in 2014 uh, the Iranians decided to zero victory, uh, history, and make it sound like the history of Iraq, the modern Iraq after 2003, started in 2014, because they so-called helped Iraqis to uh, get rid of ISIS, and ISIS would, could have taken over uh, Iraq. And with the Obama administration's reluctancy to help Iraq the first months against ISIS, uh, Iran took advantage, and Qasem Soleimani strengthened his position and established Al Hashd, which is a, a popular militia with a, a, an edict or a fatwa from uh, uh, Ayatollah Sistani. Now, I witnessed in the meetings of the Shia bloc, which could last three, four hours, four hours, seven hours, uh, the, the conclusion of the meeting uh, will be agreed upon of the members of the Shia bloc, which is the Islamic Council. Uh, Sayyid Abdul Aziz Hakim, Ahmed Shalabi, Adil Abdul Mahdi, all the Shia figures that you know, Ibrahim Jafari. And uh, after the meeting's finished and they conclude the meeting, they will say, let's wait for the approval of the Hajji. The Hajji is, is the code name for Qasim Soleimani. So even with them sitting in Baghdad and making the decision uh, and uh, voting on it, uh, they, have, they still have to get the approval of Qasim Soleimani. And that shows you the influence psychologically and politically and militarily on the Shia blocs in Iraq. Now, uh, Qasim Soleimani uh, it, it tried early on to kill Americans in Iraq. He had no assets in Iraq then to kill Americans. And, and he relied heavily on Muqtada Sadr and what they call Jaysh al-Mahdi. However, from that, point, he also sought of Muqtada Sadr, as uh, we can call him, a loose cannon for Iran. He's not 100% controllable. Uh, we have to, I have to remind your audience and the people that Iranians are control freaks. And no matter how much they could, they control you, they want to control you more. Uh, and uh, you literally have to be uh, completely uh, at their uh, disposal any time uh, when they control you. And they didn't see in Muqtada Sasadar that. And in the major event of 2008, over they call it charge of the Knights uh, military operation in Basra, in which Nur al-Maliki, with the help of, with a lot of help from the United States of America, uh, attacked the Sadrist or the Jaysh al-Mahdi in Basra, uh, Qasim Soleimani, uh, allowed this to happen to kind of uh, 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 give Muqtada a warning or eliminate his, his expanded power. And, uh, but, but when the US Army went too far in expelling the Sadrist, uh, Qasim Soleimani, sure enough, 
contacted his uh, uh, close uh, uh, friend or uh, person he works with for many decades, uh, the President Jalal Talabani. They met on the Iranian-Iraqi border and uh, he requested uh, the, the Iraqis and the Americans would withdraw from Basra and there was a ceasefire. And this way he basically hit the Sadrists at the same time, saved them. Uh, uh, another incident uh, which I was part of in 2012, June 2012, um, uh, Maliki was acting uh, out of control. Uh, there's a lot of waste, uh, uh, unimaginable uh, amount of, of uh, corruption. Uh, the Iraqi uh, oil revenue boosted up. The oil revenues were very high. Oil barrel was like, exceeded 115 to 120 dollars. Is the highest in very long time in decades. And despite of all of that, about 800 billion dollars were wasted and went to, to corruption. So Ahmed Chalabi asked my help, and I was then in Beirut heading uh, what you call it Asia TV, which was uh, owned by Ahmed Chalabi. And uh, he told me to make a campaign against Maliki because he has a deal with Muqtada Sadr. And he was able to lobby uh, members of the Iraqi parliament to get 50% plus one votes to oust uh, Maliki. Because according to the Iraqi constitution, if you get 50 plus one signatures of the Iraqi parliament, that these names will go to the uh, uh, president of Iraq. And the president of Iraq then will uh, sign a letter uh, firing the prime minister asking the parliament to elect a new prime minister. Uh, so I was very excited. I was very enthusiastic, maybe a little bit too naive. Uh, uh, someone who works very closely with Qasem Soleimani came to me personally, to my office, and told me, Antifal, you need to stop this effort. I said, what effort? He said, the effort to oust um, Maliki. Hajj Qasem is very angry at you, and he wants you to stop it. I said, uh, this uh, talk, you should not direct it to me, you should direct it to Dr. Chalabi. I work for him. I, I can't tell him, uh, I cannot do something else when he tell me, uh, and I uh, and at the same time, I agree with Chalabi 100%, and I'm very enthusiastic, and I think what we're doing is very constitutional. I don't know why uh, 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 Qasem Soleimani is upset. He said he's very upset, and Chalabi will be punished, and so as Muqtada will be punished. And sure enough, uh, 167 names and signatures were sent to President Jalal Talabani, and President Jalal Talabani got a phone call from Qasem Soleimani asking him not to sign the letter and the attempt will have failed. And uh, Chalabi was crushed, to be honest with you. And we were all very crushed and very uh, sad of this moment in which we realized we have uh, absolutely lost the control of Iraq and the constitution of Iraq, which I consider is a good constitution, it's probably the best constitution in the Middle East or other than Israel, better than any of the Arab countries, and even better some of the European countries. It's a very cons very good constitution, uh, was written with the help of the United States, and it's the only piece of paper which is approved directly by a popular refer referendum of the Iraqis. Unfortunately, the Americans who championed this constitution and helped us to do it, did not help us to defend it and their priorities were different. Uh, and uh, so we saw the throwing away off of the constitution uh, and replaced by hegemony uh, rule, uh, micromanagement of Iran or everything of the Iraqi affairs. And the constitution will only be utilized or used to, to uh, keep uh, Iranian proxies and corrupt people in power. Uh, and co commit to uh, timelines of, uh, 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 of uh, elections or timelines of uh, uh, electing prime minister, but the powers of the of the uh, of the president, which is to fire and hire uh, a prime minister, has gone forever, and the, the the president will come to his power or to his position. Any president, and I'm not only saying about Jalal Talmani, will come with a 
uh, with a, 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 a already made deal with Iran that he would not use these powers unless in consultation with Iran. Uh, I think today I send you two videos, one of them showing a meeting in Abu Bahdi al Muhandis house in Baghdad, where they are discussing, uh, they call them the jokers, the, the, uh, the demonstrators, because they consider them they are American jokers. And they, uh, they how, uh, discussing how to kill them, uh, sniper them with pictures, uh, uh, air pictures, uh, satellite pictures of the areas of the demonstrations, Al Tahrir Square, and the high rise building where the demonstrators were in control of, which is called the Turkish restaurant, because there used to be a Turkish restaurant at the top level in the 90s. And uh, also, I showed you another picture, uh, send you another video in which Qasim Suleiman is saying, if the parliament of uh, elects uh, ahead of the parliament uh, uh, elected by members of parliament and the Sayyid al-Qaid, which is the, uh, the master uh, leader uh, Khamenei, says no, he should be deposed. So uh, all that, uh, 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 there was a kind of a limited, uh, or there was some limit to Iranian hegemony in Iraq during the American presence. But after 2011, there was a massive uh, transformation and very quick to total control and elimination of thousands of Iraqis who were uh, pro-Americans or work with the CIA, or work with the US, US military. Uh, I would say at least 20,000 has been, were killed, uh, disappeared or kidnapped, or um, if they were lucky, they were able to escape and no one heard about them. Uh, so there was a purge, the same purge that happened in Afghanistan now. The only reason, the only thing, it, it was not covered in Iraq more of, as a, of a, a state rather than Afghanistan. And uh, it, was, it happened very quietly with Iranian or covert operations to eliminate those people. And, uh, and uh, the viciousness of the Iranians became, uh, came out to the surface and uh, leading to, as I said, ISIS, the ISIS, appearance of ISIS, which was a very natural result of the oppressive policies of uh, Iran in Iraq against the Sunnis, uh, which basically uh, led to ISIS as if Iranians were in need for ISIS to legitimize their uh, uh, creation of militias. I give you another example, which I personal experience when the Mosul fell into the hand of ISIS and Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi came riding on a horse like, a, uh, like a, 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 what we see in, uh, in historical movies about uh, Islamic leaders. Uh, uh, he was very charismatic. He was very impressive. And he, uh, he acted like a, an Islamic historical conqueror. And uh, it was a very sad moment for, for me. I, I cried and I called, uh, I was in Beirut and I called Ahmed Chalabi and you know, my line with Chalabi in Beirut most likely listened to by Hezbollah and, uh, and the Iranians, uh, but I couldn't hold myself. I told him what's happening uh, in, uh, in Mosul reminds me when I was young in, in June 5th, when the Israelis took over Sinai and the whole, uh, uh, mythology of uh, the, uh, the Arab victory against Israel collapsed, uh, seeing Egyptian uh, uh, the soldiers uh, lost in the desert, hungry and naked, uh, which was very sad moment. And uh, in, in uh, not because not because Israel took over this land, but because of the defeat and the mountain of lies we lived in. So the same thing we were told that the Iraqi army is capable. Uh, in 2011, I received a report, comprehensive report done by the Americans and Iraqis about the Iraqi Ministry of Defense, which shows the readiness of the Iraqi army was 25%. Uh, despite of that, Maliki insisted on American withdrawal because of Iranian pressure. So they know the Iraqi army is not capable of defending. They know that the Iran Americans' uh, departure will create, a, will make a big return of terror. But despite that, they went for it. And uh, the, the plan was to give up half of Mosul, the west, 
the, the right side of Mosul, as they call it, of the river, to ISIS to legitimize forming the militia. But when they did that, the army couldn't hold, and the morale collapsed, and the whole Mosul uh, collapsed. But Soleimani was very happy. Anyway, so I continued. So I told Chalabi, this is like what we call it in Arabic, the next the Depression Day. And, uh, and he said, and I said, I heard that you want to form the Hashid and militias. Uh, that would be a disaster for Iraq. Chalabi, surprisingly, told me, yes, I agree with you. It is going to be a disaster. But, he, but then Chalabi went on and told me, you know what? Qasim Soleimani just left. He was in my house. We had lunch together. And after lunch, he asked me if he could take a nap because he was waiting for Najaf to issue the fatwa to form the militias. So before, the, so he knew before the fatwa was issued, there will be a fatwa issued or an edict issued to form a hashid, which tells you that was a pre-planned thing to form these militias and to take advantage of ISIS to form uh, some, uh, to start the formation of something similar to the IRGC in Iraq or Quds for, Quds for in Iraq and two governments in one country. Uh, and as we see this power continue to expand at the expense of the Iraqi army and the Iraqi police. So, uh, but uh, before I end my, what I am saying, uh, the killing of Qasim Soleimani and the timing of it cannot be any better. Qasim Soleimani was uh, responsible directly for killing, uh, as it's officially said, 800 demonstrators, real numbers reaches up to 3,500 demonstrators by sniper shots, kidnapping, killing, rapes, you name it. Um, and also Qasim on his uh, uh, recent days before his demise was uh, planning uh, and putting together a major plan to make Baghdad as a second uh, capital of the empire, make Baghdad another Tehran, uh, and uh, to the point that Baghdad could become an alternative uh, to, uh, to Tehran in case if they need, the, if something happened in Tehran or the regime falls or something happened, they have Iraq. And, uh, and he was about to uh, annex Iraq to Iran. Uh, it's also, I mean, when I worked with the Islamists who worked for Iran, uh, they don't call it Iran, they call it the Islamic Republic, not because they want to use a short name, because the Islamic Republic to them uh, includes Iraq, Lebanon, the whole Middle East, Saudi Arabia, Mecca, and, and them being in Baghdad, uh, it's like sitting in, in a, uh, in Baghdad and the Constantinopolis of the modern time is Tehran, where they have to uh, get the approval for everything they move. So they are uh, like physically connected to Iran as part of Iran. And the Iraqi economy, the Iraqi state should be at the service as like a wilaya or a state, a part of, uh, an, a part of Iran. Uh, but Qasim Soleimani was ambitious enough to make it happen. And uh, it's very interesting how much chauvinistic the Iranian regime in terms uh, with, the, with, the, with what I call it religious facade. Uh, if you look at the map in Iraq now, uh, one of the major uh, uh, compounds for the Iraqi uh, militias who work for Iran, the, uh, the, uh, it's near uh, uh, an area called Salman Park, which is basically uh, the 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 palace of the Persian uh, uh, king when the Persian Empire center was in in Iraq, and so they the 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 they never uh, with the, despite they claim Islam, they they never uh, quit this idea of the uh, the expansion of the Persian Empire, and uh, the coming back to the its roots and its origin, which was near Baghdad in Iraq and Salman Park. Uh, so therefore, I think uh, one of the plans that he was working on is to uh, fake or, or uh, stage out a, a coup d'etat uh, and uh, use this uh, pretext of a coup d'etat uh, to, uh, to oppress it and to stop the coup d'etat and then 
uh, trial and kill uh, hundreds of uh, officers, high uh, ranking officials, the politicians uh, who will be accused of participating into this kutida is a play. And his, his last trip to Iraq was to do that. So, and all, not to mention the ethnic cleansing and the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the attempt to change the contents of Iraq and to eliminate and uh, obliterate the Sunnis and make the Sunnis people without land or land without people. Uh, and the bridge through Iraq, which, which will be, was used to transfer weapons, fighters to uh, Syria and to Lebanon and to threaten Israel and to extend the, uh, the arm of Iran to the uh, Mediterranean. So I, I, think, uh, I think the United States, the decision to kill Qasem Soleimani and Abu Mahdi al-Muhandis, one of the best decisions the United States had made in the past four decades, uh, since the, uh, the mullahs of Tehran took over power in, in, in Iran after the, uh, the fall of the Shah. Thank you. And I'm here ready to uh, receive questions. It sounds like Soleimani was at the nexus of some of the central decisions, uh, central military decisions that the regime was uh, was uh, tasking its uh, implementers with. He, his death was a real blow. We saw that after his liquidation, the regime was reeling. There was no coherent response. Absolutely. Uh, that's another thing, uh, Irina. Uh, Qasem Soleimani, and I heard this from people who work closely with him, was receiving three billion, with capital B, uh, dollars from uh, his government for his operations. And I heard that Rouhani, uh, through his uh, attempts to do reform, was trying to limit uh, the, the spending or control the spending. And he thought he would be get the backing of Khamenei. And Khamenei told him, leave Qasem Soleimani spend whatever he wants and do whatever he wants and don't interfere his work. Imagine one person budget three billion, that's a budget of a country in the Middle East, not to mention the money that he uh, making from drug, uh, drugs and oil smuggling in Iraq and in Lebanon and Yemen and other operations. And not to mention also, he had his own networks. I doubt there is, I don't think you can find a documented records of what he was doing in the uh, files or dossiers of the Iranian government. Uh, he was working uh, uh, with complete secrecy as a, and uh, because of the nature of the regime, just like the Soviet Union, there's always somebody like him, a strong man who will rise up and will uh, be in charge of everything and control everything. Uh, that's why I think the demise of Qasem Soleimani, it is impossible. Uh, 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 to be uh, to find uh, that Iran will find someone to fill his shoes, and I really encourage people, Israel uh, countries who are uh, suffering from uh, Iranian terrorism, to reevaluate Iran in light of this new uh, era of post Soleimani era. After after he died, the regime has tried to replace him with various. Uh... Uh, less significant actors like Ghani, and they've appointed various uh, officials in various places. None of them had his authority. In fact, it sounds like the regime called or some operations began to slip. But the United States failed to take advantage of this uh, chaotic aftermath. Why do you think uh, the US did not use the, the regime vulnerabilities following Soleimani's uh, liquidation to its advantage? Well, I tell you one thing. Uh, Qani, a, 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 a very uh, important person in Iraq told me, uh, when Qani first took power, he came to Iraq and they were making fun of him, the militias, because he came to Baghdad and he brought them rings as gifts. And they were make those big guys are, are multi millionaires. Some of them maybe even billionaires now. He brought them rings to show that he likes them. Well, Qasem Soleimani, when he come, he come with suitcases of cash and some nice advanced weapons 
to give them to improve their capabilities. Uh, this guy bring them rings. He cannot speak proper Arabic. He knows nothing about Iraq. And I've been told many of the militias are taking decisions, including the attempt to kill the prime minister without telling him. In fact, they are voluntarily taking the advice and the orders from Hassan Nasrallah of Hezbollah, rather from Qani, because they consider Hassan Nasrallah is more senior and, and more knowledgeable of Iraq. So the killing of Qasim Soleimani uh, and, and also the accessibility to, the, to, the, uh, to Khamenei. Qani apparently doesn't have the free accessibility, uh, you know, and this kind of regimes accessibility to the top figure is not easy process. But Qasim Soleimani was very accessible to Khamenei. He was able to get decisions promptly from Khamenei. Uh, but, uh, so uh, this led this retreat in the, uh, in the malicious performance in the elections, their in, even incapability to even forge the elections, uh, the, the chaos that we see in Lebanon, the retreat of the Houthis uh, somehow in Yemen, all relate, related to the absence of Qasim Soleimani. There is absolutely no one figure in Iran who is capable of controlling and handling all these events. Uh, and and uh, who, I mean, the Iranian stretch, stretch very thin, but Qasim was capable of by his maneuvering, his charisma, his knowledge. He's been doing this for 40 years, four decades, day and night. So I, I, I'm not trying to say the Iranian regime is going to fall or claim they are uh, going to be less uh, effective, but uh, that definitely more chaotic and more uh, uh, and more unorganized of what they do. Uh, they're, they're, therefore, all possibilities uh, are open now. U.S. is at the juncture where it can put significant pressure on these operations, at least as part of negotiating strategy in Vienna. Instead, it's actually allowing uh, all these uh, recent events by Iran to go, uh, despite the fact that Iran is at a, in a vulnerable position, the US is not taking advantage of it, as we've seen. Just to take- No, I mean, look, look, the, this, these talks reminds me of US policies in Iraq from 2003, we were held accountable if we deal with the Iranians. We were accused by the American media of being, um, Ahmed Chalabi was accused of being an Iranian stooge and Iranian spy. And we were point, fingers were pointed at us because we were dealing with the Iranians. We were friendly to the Iranians. We don't say bad things about them because we, have, we were abiding by a deal. The deal was we don't say bad things about Iran and Iran will not kill the Americans during the invasion. And that deal was happened. But at the same time, the top ambassador in Iraq, the US officials from the State Department, appease and love Iranian proxies in Iraq. They go sit down and meet with Badr Brigade. They go sit down with uh, the, the, the Islamic Revolutionary Council at that time they called themselves. They called themselves, and they changed the name now to Hikmah. They sit down with all Iran proxies and then during the Obama administration, the ambassador of the United States of America will go visit militias in their houses at night and tell them, uh, we, we are not against you. We are uh, partners in this war against ISIS. The American consul in Basra went and visited militia who were uh, wounded in the hospital. So, and so the, the, uh, this addiction, American addiction, trying to appease Iran, hoping that Iran will be nice to us, it has never been has never been any failure more than that, and has proven more and more that Iran is not a is not going to be nice to us and stop killing us because we are nice to them. It's it's the other way around. The more you are nice to them, the more they're going to kill from you. The more you are nice to them, the more they're going to take advantage of you. So I'm not sure what these talks are about. I mean. If Iran limits their nuclear capability, if, there's a big if, what about their expansion in the region? What about killing Americans? What about their threat to Saudi Arabia? What about their threat to Israel? What about their threat to the American interest in the region? Is that all acceptable because they want to 
they may, they may, in the wishful thinking, stop their nuclear program. So it it's it's it doesn't make any sense. I think it's more of uh, as I keep telling Iraqis, American foreign policy is not governed by American interest internationally. It's more governed by uh, internal issues and ideologies in Washington rather than by what the United States benefits and interests are. It seems to me that the regime is taking advantage of this current weakness of the policy to try to kind of rebuild itself, even as it's struggling uh, with, with the vacuum left by Soleimani. Uh, why did it sanction US, former US officials two years after these events, they are no longer in power. So money has been gone for two years. The world has moved on in whatever way it could. Why now? What's what's the purpose of two year absence? And it's not like the Biden administration particularly cares about its predecessors. Because they see weakness in the Biden administration, number one. Number two, they are, they are trying, struggling to save their face because they promised to take revenge of after Qasem Soleimani. And there's something you should people know. The Iranian regime never fight with Iranians. They fight with Arabs. Have you seen Soleimani surrounded by uh, Iranian soldiers? Never. He's always surrounded by Lebanese and Iraqis and Yemenites. So they burn, they burn, they use the Shia Arabs uh, to, to fight their wars against the whole world while uh, while they uh, they avoiding uh, that's one of the problems during the Bush administration. Like, let's I remember Ambassador Khalizad came to Ahmed Chalabi and asked him to uh, help stop bombarding the Green Zone. And Chalabi called Qasim Soleimani and told him, "I have Ambassador Khalizad here, and I don't want." Please, can you stop bombardment? So Qasim Soleimani told him, I'm going to stop the bombardment 48 hours. And the little guy in Sadr City with a small mortar got a phone call from Tahan or from his boss in Baghdad, told him stop bombarding. And 40 hours was zero bombardment to the green zone. So what is that telling you? This guy is acting upon orders from Tahran. So the target should be Tehran, not Sadr City. I'm not saying allow a terrorist to be free in Baghdad, but the origin or origin of the problem is Tehran, and Tehran has been so far tremendously successful. I think that their major success is to transfer the battle from Tehran to Baghdad, to transfer the battle from Tehran to Beirut, to transfer the bat battle from Tehran to Yemen, and Tehran stay out of it. If you, the, kill, the killing of Qasem Soleimani was the very first time the United States attacked the real cause and the source of the problem. That's why it was right. Not because he's a bad guy, because they have attacked the real origin of the problem, the source of the problem. If you don't attack the source of the problem, the problem will continue. So Israel is a small country. They, have, they cannot afford to go bomb Tehran, but they can defend their, themselves. They can defend their borders as much as they can. But the United States should look at it differently. And if, unless we transfer the battle to Tehran, we're going to see more and more failures. I'm seeing something very strange that leads me to question the motivations of this administration with the talks in, uh, in Vienna. It's one thing to consider them misguided, uninformed, naive, and uh, and foolish, but uh, sooner or later, a misguided, delusional, uh, poorly informed policy will corrupt itself once, once its uh, uh, implementers see that it's not working. But what I'm seeing is a pattern. The Vienna talks are floundering. You know, the Iran in months has not provided any, any sign of uh, doing anything uh, that would be required to show good faith. In Yemen, the Houthis are in disarray. The Iranian ambassador met, its, met his end 
there's been controversy whether he died from COVID, from an airstrike, or some other, or some only at some other violent end. But he's gone, and with him absent from Yemen, uh, the Arab coalition has been on the offensive, and there's been um, a lot of territory retaken in recent weeks. Yes, it's all I think is a. I think it, it 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 must has a it must have a uh, uh, something to do with the absence of Qasem Soleimani. And the U from the U.S. perspective, previously they could say, well, Houthis are controlling all this territory. They're de facto uh, authority on the ground. We have to talk to them. We have to try to uh, negotiate with them. Now they are on the defensive. They're increasingly losing grip, and it's very clear that like any other uh, Iranian proxy, they can, it's possible for them to be pushed back. They're not, um, they're not indispensable and they're certainly not, there's nothing about them that's unavoidable. Yet, despite these facts, despite the fact that it's, it's become obvious from recent events that Iranian proxies are not invulnerable, that they can be combated, U.S. still continues to pursue the same course of action as if Iran was yes. at right yeah. of its power and as yes. if all these proxies retained full control. Now, I can understand when Iran is appears to be strong, a weak administration could say, well, we have to negotiate and try diplomacy and so forth. It's a position of weakness, but it's understandable. But now Iran is actually losing ground everywhere what what could possibly be driving the administration now to not put pressure and not to take advantage of obvious losses to continue the momentum it's almost as if the us wants iran to remain strong and it's yes yes, that, yeah, yeah, there, there is an idea uh, there is an idea in washington uh, by some um, folks here that uh, iran uh, not even should be strong, should be the number one ally to the United States of America instead of Saudi Arabia. And that's a crazy thinking, but that's what they think. Uh, and uh, they also try to make the enemy look stronger and bigger. We saw the same people did the same thing with the Soviet Union for decades. They were blowing out the, the magnitude of, of power and the strength of the Soviet Union and the Soviet Union was uh, uh, collapsing from inside. And uh, I think the problem is also there is an inconsistency of the policies in the United States. That's why you see now Gulf countries. Why do you think the Gulf countries went to the Abraham Accords? United Arab Emirates was one of, was one of the fiercest uh, Arab nationalist countries, by the way. They were completely anti-Israel. They were helping uh, uh, suicide bombers uh, or people, their houses demolished by Israel by rebuilding their houses and giving them money for decades. The same thing Saudi for Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is the biggest contributors in the history of mankind to the Palestinians. How could how they were able to change course because of the inconsistency of the United States policies, because of the double standards? As I told you in Iraq, they accuse us and they point fingers on us that we have good relations with Iran. While they sit with a guy who works directly for Iran and he doesn't even deny it because they think he is a de facto and he is in, indigenous, but we are not indigenous. So, so, so this, this, this inconsistency, that's why you see Gulf countries now going to make relations with China. They're going to go make relations with Russia, getting weapons from Russia because you cannot rely on the United States because you buy, you buy airplanes, F-35s, and the deal may get may be canceled when the election, when the president of the United States is changed, as we see now. So that's a huge, and that's what makes Iran strong. Is is the weakness and the inconsistency is not Iran itself strong. I don't think so. I mean, they are not to be underestimated, but they are not impossible to defeat, especially their militias. Believe me, when when there was a, a, a airstrikes against militia headquarters and centers and weapon depots in 2019, militias were nowhere to be found, militia leaders. They all escaped to Beirut. They all changed their phone numbers. They all stopped using phones. 
they were I was going to see a call from back that people were laughing at them. They are nowhere to be found. And then all of a sudden, uh, Biden come and give them like a, a fresh air an oxygen. OK, and that's exactly what the problem is. The root, it seems, of the problem is actually the fact that at the end of the day, these ideologues, it's not just that they're naive about uh, the use of power or that they uh, just want to have their own policy and not follow Trump's policy, but the fact that they want Iran to dominate the area, that seems to be the root cause and they can make all the excuses, justifications, the Biden administration can claim that it's negotiating in Vienna in good faith. And, but after- This is after not gonna stop Iran uh, plans to dominate the Middle East. Believe me, I spoke, I speak, I spoke to many people who, are, uh, who grew up in Iran, uh, who understands Iran and who are still loyal to Iran. And they tell me they have obsession with Saudi Arabia even more than Israel and Jerusalem. They think they, that Iran should take over Mecca and that's how they become the rulers of the Muslim world. Do you think and the administration understands that? No. Even if they understand it, I'm telling you, there are some people here within that Obama administration, some a, a, a US official. Look, let's look at 2017, what happened in Kirkuk. Qasem Soleimani, after the referendum of Kurdistan, has nothing to do with the referendum. I, I published a video, you've probably seen it. He was talking to people, telling them how this is a doomsday, apocalyptic uh, uh, thing that Kirkuk must, they, must fall into his hand, which has nothing to do with the referendum. Of, of, uh, and so he established an operation room, which I told US officials here, even during the Trump administration, they didn't believe it. And then they went and looked at it and they, they the intelligence told them, yeah, he was in running day, hour to hour operations in Kirkuk. Well, guess who was there in charge of the Iraqi affair? The special envoy, Mr. McKirk. Mr. McKirk was there and Abadi was Mr. McKirk's buddy and the Washington loved Prime Minister Abadi allowed the Iraqi militias to use US made M Abram, M1 Abrams tanks with the militia flag on the tank. So the Kurds, and they crossed Kirkuk, they wanted to go to Arbil. And they start saying in the media they're going to go to Arbil. And the Kurds were able to burn few of these tanks when they crossed the line and stop them from going further to Erbil. So people walk up here in Washington and they found out that Kirkuk fell into the hand of the militias with the full approval of the special envoy representative of the Washington in Baghdad. <laughs> so, so when people say there's a, there, there's a secret deal between the US and Iran, a conspiracy theory, which I absolutely don't believe, they have the right to, to think this way. Because Mr. McKerg was cheering up the victory of, of uh, Baghdad to take over Kirkuk. And I kept telling them, this is not a fight between Baghdad and Erbil, regardless if you like Mas'ud Barazani or hate him. This is a fight between Erbil and Tahran. And Kirkuk now is not in the hand of Baghdad. Kirkuk now is in the hand of Tehran. And despite that, Abadi lost the elections. Can you believe such blunder? <laughs> they thought they could boost him to win the elections because Washington wanted him to do, have a second term. He, he gave away Kirkuk and he lost the election. What I still do not understand is what these officials are getting out of empowering Iran. They want money, they could make money from Saudi Arabia or from anybody else. They want power, they can do it the same way by, by opposing Iran and, and doing deals with the more traditional allies. What is at the head of this ideological obsession of having- I don't Iran know, but what, what I, I, I wish I know the answer, but what I heard from them, this is a de facto, this is real politique, 
those people on the ground, we have to deal with them. To the point, we give them M1, American M1 Abrams tanks. But it sounds like they're creating this reality on the ground. They're not just putting up with it. They're empowering. They are not just tolerating these actions. They empower them. Look, during the Bush administration, as much I was appreciative of liberating Iraq, we were we were puzzled by the Iranian, by the American love to Iranian proxies in Iraq. They empowered them. They empowered them. They allowed them to be empowered. They helped them to be empowered at our expense. You know, there is something else that's a mystery to me. During the Trump administration, when the maximum pressure policy appeared to be working at at least uh, constraining the resources that that would go to these militias, U.S. has taken no action to shut down the Iranian propaganda machinery in the United States. Okay, let me tell you something. Let me let me tell you something very important. The Iraqi budget allocated $2 billion salaries to the militias. Even in Lebanon, which is controlled by Hezbollah, that doesn't happen. I don't think there's a country in the world today that has a, a, a line budget to fund militias outside the government. All those militias are funded by additional to $2 billion. You're talking about three to $4 billion of logistic support. Weapons, food, cars, fuel. So the militias of Iraq cost the Iraqis say six billion to seven billion dollars, maybe more. We don't know. Now the United States are standing by Iraq financially and obtaining loans and obtaining facilities to uh, to help the Iraqi budget in American aid and weapons and intelligence. So the United States, in a way, subsidizing those militias. That I this is a, this is crazy. Why would the United States not tell Iraqi state, hey, we're not going to help you if you don't stop paying those people? Okay. The second thing is the United States share intelligence with Iraq on ISIS and other things. Then Iraq is penetrated by those people who are occupying the Ministry of Interior, the Iraqi intelligence, will take this information, serious, sensitive intelligence, and send it to Tehran. There has to be some ways to control this. And no one is looking at this. Oh, the Iraqi state is independent and, and sovereign. They can pay that. The, no, they're, if they are independent and sovereign, then, then don't help them. How could you help them? to stand up financially, and then they pay the militias. And I keep telling people here in Washington, you guys are helping the taxpayers, American taxpayers, in a way, few cents of this dollar going to the militias who are attacking you to empower you. Qais al-Khazali, the head of Asa'ab al-Haq, AAH, has 4,000 salaries a month, out of which, he pay only 500 salaries and 3,500 salaries goes to his pocket. And now they built a shrine, multi-million dollars shrine for Abu Mahdi al-Muhandis with the Iraqi state money. So Iran is fighting Iraq, controlling Iraq by using Iraq's money. Iran is not doing this with Yemen. They paying Yemeni. Iran is not doing this in Lebanon. They paying, they paying not Hassan Nasrallah, up to a billion or maybe dollar more a year. The only place that Iran is controlling at the same time taking money out of is Iran. <laughs> and the United States is standing by doing nothing. How difficult to do that? It's not difficult to tell Iraq state, I'm not going to subsidize you if you keep paying them. It seems to me that there is a fundamental mis bipartisan misunderstanding of what Iran is and isn't. Specifically, I don't think even the Republicans fully understand that Iran is fighting a total war, that the Islamic revolution for Iran is a total war, and they don't see themselves as limiting themselves to Iraq or Saudi Arabia or any particular location. But exactly. rather, 
they're putting in any resources needed, human, financial, or anything else, to achieve the exploitation of the revolution and their own dominance wherever they can. For the United yeah. States, the goal with Iran is limiting its influence and making sure that US targets are not, uh, do not become victims to Iran's policies, but fighting this limited war with limited resources and limited understanding of what Iran is actually seeking to achieve with this policy of uh, that has become dominant on both the right and the left of this semi-isolationist, uh, they're no longer world's policeman mentality. It's a suicidal policy because at the end of the day, Iran doesn't care that US doesn't want to be involved in the Middle East or anywhere else. Iran wants the United States as well as the Middle East and everywhere else completely. Okay, thank you very much for your time. I have to go to another meeting now. Hey, thank you so much and for your insights. That's I appreciate great. your invite and uh, I look forward to talk to you again. Absolutely, thank you so much. Uh, this was uh, Antipat Conva and we were looking at what is going on in the Middle East two years after Soleimani's uh, demise. Stay tuned for our future events. This was the Washington Outside and the host, uh, the editor-in-chief, Irina Zuckerman. Thank you.